Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulun nabiyul kareem, amma ba'd. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم نزل عليك الكتاب بالحق مصدقا لما بين يديه وأنزل التوراة والإنجيل من قبل هدى للناس وانزل الفرقان إن الذين كفروا بآيات الله لهم عذاب شديد والله عزيز ذو انتقام صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسول النبي الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we will inshallah um, do the tafsir for the entire chapter of uh, Surat Al Imran. This is the third chapter in the Quran. Yesterday we uh, did the second half of Surat Al Baqarah. And this is rather a long chapter, has 20 ruku, and several topics have been um, mentioned. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala affirms the veracity of the revelations. Uh, of all the books, starting from uh, whatever was revealed, uh, for example, uh, to Jesus, the Injil, or what was revealed to Musa, the Torah, and the Quran are all from the same source, and it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and um, in it is contained the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that power exclusively is in the realm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is his, he decides. And even on the earth, when somebody gets kingship, it is only with the idhn of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing such a thing to happen. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكِ تُؤْتِي الْمُلْكَ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتَنْزِلُ الْمُلْكَ مِنْ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُعِزُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ وَتُذِلُّ مَنْ تَشَاءُ بِيَدِكَ الْخَيْرِ إِنَّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ uh, to Allah belongs everything. It, uh, the kingship and kingdom belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He decides to whom he gives and he decides whomever he wants to take it back. It is in his power. And this dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّهْوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَالْبَنِينَ وَالْقَنَاتِرِ الْمُقَنْتَرَةِ مِنَ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِذَّةِ إِلَى الْآخَرِ Where this dunya, Allah has made beautiful, and not only has he made it beautiful, he has made it very attractive. And there are certain things which are especially more attractive to mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions women, their beauty, gold, silver, heaps of wealth. And that could be in many forms. It could be a big bank account for a farmer. It could mean... Um, the fruits of his uh, labor where he sees all the fruits or if he is uh, raising whatever crops he raises when it's full you know the heaps they look good they're very attractive or in the olden days nice horses if you had many that was something that was very attractive in today's day and age maybe it's a fleet of cars you know the, the more cars the nicer cars you have it looks good and it attracts people and people start working hard to gain it. You want a nicer house. You want a nicer car. You want more in your bank balance. You more gold, more silver. Um, all these things are attractive. Allah has made it, designed this world to make it very attractive. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then mentions, wait, can I tell you something that is better for you? And Allah says, لِلَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ The one for those who really fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has kept something much better for them. And that is Jannah. Jannah by comparison is no match to all the attractions of this dunya. And um, whatever is in the dunya. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises to make a dua to Allah. رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا 
فَغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا O Allah, number one, we believe in you. Forgive us from, your, from our sins. وَقِنَا ذَابَ النَّارِ Save us from the fire of hell. And Allah describes who are the people who will end up in Jannah. As-sabirin, the ones who are going to be patient. You have to wait. You have to go through this dunya. The difficulties of this dunya, you need to bear with patience. As-sadiqin, the one who is going to be truthful to what he has said by his mouth, that he's going to believe in Allah, that he's going to do all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered him to do so, and he will testify to it. As-sadiqin, wal-qanitin, the one who is going to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal-munfiqin, and the one, uh, those people who give in the path of uh, Allah, in charity. Wal-mustaghfirina bil ashar and Allah describes another characteristic of these people who will be the dwellers of Jannah, inshallah. These people ask for forgiveness during the time of Suhoor. And we also we all know what the time of Suhoor is. This is the time of Tahajjud, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to his servant and he answers. Uh, it's a special time that he answers uh, to um, his servant's call and servant's prayer. And the next topic that um, in this chapter discusses is, again, story. Two stories have been mentioned. This, the first story is the story of Yahya, salatu wassalam, who in English we call him John the Baptist. And I'm not sure how much time we have, but I'll try to be as brief as I can. Where it was the time among the Bani Israel where I think yesterday I did mention that something unique for the Bani Israel was there was always someone to advise them, to guide them. There was a guide with them along with the book. Allah sent a guide and when that guide would pass, another prophet or someone to guide them would come. And here, Zakaria والسلام, was their chief guide and the priest at that time and he was getting old. And in parallel, we have the family of Imran, and they were all related to each other. And uh, in the tafasir, it has been mentioned that Imran, um, uh, he, uh, his wife, uh, who in English, um, uh, they mentioned the word, uh, the, the, the name of Elizabeth. Um, so the wife of Imran uh, was related or from the descendants of Harun, alayhi salatu wassalam. And she makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that she um, have a child so that she can devote this child in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exclusively. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts her prayer. And for, uh, when she finally gets um, the baby, she realizes that she has delivered a female child. But she had already dedicated the child in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there was a problem and the problem was whenever a child would be dedicated that child would be raised in the precincts of the masjid and it was exclusively male that women were not permitted to be within the precincts and be raised and so an exception was created where Maryam alayhi salatu was salam uh, she named her, uh, her Maryam and she was raised within the precincts. And as the, in the tafsir they describe, she was raised like a dove and she was fed by the angels. And this was obvious. She was raised right from the beginning in a pure form. And Zakaria والسلام, was her caretaker, was her guardian. And whenever she, he would get in, to see Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam, she, he would always find all kinds of food on her table. And it was very unusual. The ulama describe that he would see sometimes fruits that are found in summer, but at this time it was winter. This was no season for such a kind of uh, fruit to be present. And he would find that on her table. And he asks her, Ya Maryam, anna laki hada. Where does this all this come for you? And she replies that it is from Allah. Inna Allah yarzuqu man yasha bi ghairi hisab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives for whom he wills without any measure. And when he sees that, he's an old man. 
he is childless and a hope comes into him. Because when something is impossible, that fruit that uh, he is seeing on the table of Maryam wasalam, was impossible to have come. He says, then there is nothing that is impossible in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he has lost hope. He has become old. His wife has become old. And yet he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a child. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers his prayers and he is given the good news of a child. And this was Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam. So lesson to be learned, never lose hope. Never lose hope for there is always hope as long as you put your faith and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Yahya alayhi salatu wasalam was, you can say, a precursor to Jesus. So he came, he, got the, he brought the good news, but as it happened, they plotted against him. This is, a, again, a story I'm cutting short, where he, at a very young age, is killed. So he passes, and it is within that time frame that Maryam wasalam, is miraculously given the good news that she is going to bear a child. And this child was no ordinary child. Number one, he, uh, he was born without a father. Maryam wasalam, was pure. There was no man who touched her. And miraculously, she um, conceives Jesus. Now, I, I, can't, I, I wish I could go into the um, details, but suffice to uh, say that Jesus was born um, in a similar fashion that uh, a woman would bear, and she goes through the pains of childbirth. Again, to emphasize that Jesus was made of flesh and blood. He was a very much a human being like you and me. He was not a spirit, but of course, when I use the word spirit in the sense that he was flesh and blood and he was supported with the spirit, which is Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. But there was, he was again, a human being and there are no attributes of God on Auzubillah. No question, he came with clear signs. When I say clear signs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him such powers that he could take some earth soil he could shape it in the form of a bird he would say bismillah bi idnillah and he would blow into it and that would become a bird so it would come live a dead man he would touch and the dead man would wake up and uh, become alive bi idnillah and these were such clear signs that there was no question that he was a prophet of allah and Despite seeing such clear signs, the Bani Israel reject him. And at that time, Allah when Isa alayhi salam realizes the kufr from Bani Israel, he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a story, inshallah, it will be repeated uh, at a later time. But uh, suffice to say that when he is rejected, the people who are against him, and this was primarily... Uh, the priests of Bani Israel, because they had spinned a web and the religion had been twisted to their advantage. There were people who were doing things that were wrong and the priests would not stop them. And it was like in today's world, where if you need a fatwa, you go pay an imam, an azubillah, you will find the, the fatwa that would suit you. You keep going to one of the final imams and you pay him well, an azubillah. And he'll make a fatwa that would be right in your uh, cause. I'm told, Allah knows best, that there are certain banks in the Middle East who give uh, money. If you put a deposit in their bank, they will give you a certain percentage on a monthly basis. And they call it profit. And there are people who have actually justified this, which is clearly riba. When you have put money into a bank account and they say that they'll give you 2.5% profit every month guaranteed. That is nothing but riba, my dear brothers, but you'll find fatwas today. So in the same way, the, the, the people of Bani Israel there, they had such similar uh, arrangements 
and they would not stop people from doing evil or doing something wrong. And here Isa was salam is bringing the pure message back to the people and this was not acceptable. So they plotted against him until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to take him back so that he will come back one day and he's yet to come and that is another story for another day which would be beyond the scope of our discussion today. So Isa alayhi salatu wasalam is taken back and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awoos and says that until the day of judgment those people who plotted against you they will always be below the people who are believing in you. Those who believe in Isa alayhi salatu was salam, which of course includes Muslims because we believe in all the prophets, they will always be have an upper hand compared to those people who plotted and tried to kill Isa alayhi salatu was salam. And here um, we move to a topic that is somewhat connected because I mentioned that the priests and the scholars of that time, they did not prevent people from doing evil or doing something wrong, although they were seeing that it was clearly wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out and orders the believers, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attuqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O believers, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the, the right that Allah has, that he be feared. Hold on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, join together and don't start fighting with each other, especially in matters that are very clear. When something's very clear, you don't argue about it. For example, if there is something about riba, don't argue about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises us, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ تَفَرَّقُوا Don't become like those people who started to fight among each other. وَاخْتَلَفُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And these are the people who will end up getting the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the best of Ummah. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ You are the best of ummah that has been brought out from among mankind. And why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains further. تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ That you enjoin that which is good and you forbid that which is evil. And my dear brothers, as long as you can hold on to it. When something is wrong, you call it wrong. Don't argue about it because there is some ulterior motive or some vested interest. And when the, you see something evil, try to stop it. And as long as you can do that, Allah will keep you above the others. But when we start losing this, we pre pretty much become the same as others. And rather, Allah's anger will descend on us. When we know something is wrong and we don't try to prevent it, then Allah's anger will fall on us just like the previous nations fell into this calamity. So when something, again, I have to repeat, when something is wrong, call it wrong. And when you see something, try your level best to stop it. And there are three stages of Iman, as Rasulullah has mentioned in the Hadith, where if you see something wrong, try to stop it by force. If you cannot do it by force, at least by your mouth, open your tongue, speak out. And if you can't even do that, at least feel bad in your heart. And Rasulullah said, this is the last degree of Iman, the weakest of Iman, where you at least feel bad in your heart if you don't have the strength to say or stop it with your hand by force. Moving on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, moves towards, it is a continuation of the topic, the topic where you stand for justice. I mentioned about enjoining what is good, forbidding what is evil, and the highest state of Iman is when you see something that has been wrong, you stand up and you fight for it. You fight for justice. Don't just stay quiet. 
you go above and beyond and try to fight and defend those people who have been wronged. And this is the state of Iman that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala desires from you and me. And there is a myth that if you are a man of God, all we should do is sit and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is true in a sense that your salah is important. Your zakah is important. All that is part of worship. But then people think fighting in the cause of Allah is something that is distasteful or for a priest or for a man, a, a godly man to do that is not something of uh, something of liking. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dispels that myth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَكَئِيمٍ مِّن نَبِيٍ قَاتَلَ مَعَهُ رَبِّيُّنَ كَثِيرٌ How many prophets have come who stood up and fought with a band of righteous people and defended others' rights, fought for justice. فَمَا وَهَنُوا لِمَا أَصَابَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ and because when they, when they moved, there were so many difficulties that they had to face. But they faced those difficulties and they did not lose heart. They did not lose courage. They went on to fight. And when their only dua was, Rabbana, faghfir lana dhunubana. Oh Allah, forgive our sins. Wa israfana fi amrina. And the, the, the excess that we commit by mistake, if we have committed anything in excess, O oh Allah, forgive us. And O oh Allah, forgive us. So after that, again, it's a continuation. The story of Uhud, the second battle of Islam that was fought, um, has been mentioned. And this is rather a long um, story. I'll try to be as brief as possible because I'm running out of time. Um, Uhud was the second battle that was fought in Islam, second major battle that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fought. The first one was Badr, and this topic will come in um, uh, in the next few nights, inshallah, when we uh, talk about um, um, uh, another chapter. Now here, Uhud was the second battle where Abu Sufyan, he gathers 3,000 people and now is marching from Mecca towards Medina. So they are well equipped. There are 3,000 in number. And Rasulullah Wasallam learns about this um, earlier on. And he mentions this to the Sahaba. So he sits down and he does mashura. This is a lesson for us where he's taking an opinion from all the other Sahaba. And the Sahaba, they give their opinion saying that let's go out of Medina and let us fight. So Rasulullah takes their opinion. And mind you, the, the opinion of our Prophet was different. His opinion was let us stay within Medina and defend um, Medina. But the majority opinion was to go out of Medina and defend outside. So here, he, uh, this is again a lesson for us that when you discuss such an important topic, get everybody together. And then he, he took the majority opinion. And then he goes out, he chooses a place which was Uhad, and this was a mountain. So the reason he chose that was on his back was the mountain, and the mountain would cover them so that no enemy can come from the back and attack them. And in front, he faced the enemy. There was one narrow gap in the mountains that were protecting them from the back, the back of the mountain of Uhad. There was one narrow alley that was there that was a potential uh, weakness. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa orders 50 archers to defend that narrow alley. And he orders them and tells them, no matter what, you're not going to leave your spots. Even if you see that the bird, we are all dead and the birds are eating our flesh, you're not going to move from there. But miraculously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help comes and the battle has just started. And before you know it, the Muslims are driving the Kuffar, the Quraysh away and they're all running away. And now these 50 archers are standing and they see that the battle is already over and people are collecting Mala Ghanima, the booty. And they, they start 
moving out of their positions to go and collect the booty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers here saying, Minkum may yuridu dunya wa minkum may yuridu akhirah. Some of you had come there to seek the akhirah, but there are some of you who came to seek the dunya. And here the leader of those 50 archers stops them. And he tells them, look, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told you not to move. But they started arguing. Again, going back to the subject, they started to argue and they said, well, Rasulullah said this in the case of defeat. Now we have won. So for a moment, stop, pause. When the Prophet tells you something, when it's very clear, don't argue about it. Just follow. Even if your logic says other things, if your logic um, is telling you that this may be wrong, as long as it is the word of Allah, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do not argue. So here the, the archers leave their spot and they start collecting the booty and the enemies of Islam see that. They watch the weakness and they come from behind and attack the Muslims. And it ends up being um, a battle that was lost. And of course the Sahaba, despite uh, the fact that the whole army was in disarray, they still try to defend and they thwart the enemy, but in reality, they had lost the war. And there are many lessons for us to, be, to learn, but I'm going to close here because we are running out of time. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he help us understand and enlighten us from the teachings of the Quran. And let us make this dua, which is in the end of uh, Al Imran. Rabbana innana sami'na munadiyan yunadi lil imani an aminu bi rabbikum fa'amanna. ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تغزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسول النبي الكريم سبحان ربك رب العزة يما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين